All right, we're live once again. Saturday, February 6th, and we've got Matt Martin again. It's deja vu here. How's it going, Matt? Uh, good morning, Chris. How's it going today? Pretty good, pretty good. Pleasure to have you back. We had you on a couple weeks ago. Anyone who hasn't seen that stream, definitely go back and watch it. But uh, today we're, we're changing focus a little bit. You're doing some bass flies with us. That's the plan. Yeah, we're going to do uh, three of my favorite patterns um, uh, that I use in the local southern Ontario area for smallmouth and largemouth. Um, both effective flies. These are I mainly fish uh, mostly still water with these patterns, but nothing saying they wouldn't work in a uh, river environment as well. Sure. Um, but yeah, bass season's coming up soon. You know, it's it's. I think we could already. February here. Sure. Um, can't wait for the ice to go away and trout season to come and go and then it's on the <laughs> yeah it's a ways out that leaves us lots of time to tie flies so that's a nice plus yep. can you hear me chris yep yeah i can hear you can you hear me barely but i think we'll make it work i might just jump into it interesting you're coming through fine on this side hopefully it smooths itself out i will throw things over to you to, to talk your way through this one though you did a great job leading last all right See what you got. What are we starting on? Ready to go? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Uh, so first things first, um, we're going to go over uh, three different patterns today. Um, the main one that I'm going to start with um, is a fly that I've been developing the last couple of seasons. Uh, I call it Matt's Crazy Cray. Uh, there's a few reasons for it. It is based off of um, all, like I, I, I've tweaked the ultimate shrimp pattern, which is an awesome saltwater fly. Um, to make it into a really re reasonable, re realistic, and simple to tie crayfish fly uh, for freshwater. Um, this is it here. I showed some photos up on my own personal Instagram over the last few days. Um, it's got a really good profile. It's got a, a tail that, as you strip it, will actually collapse uh, and cause it to uh, wobble a lot, like a, a similar to like a crankbait in conventional fishing. Uh, and when it sits on the bottom, it's perfect profile, claws up. Um, and hook point fully exposed there. Uh, it's just really simple, really good all around crayfish fly. The reason I tie, tried to design something like that was a lot of the crayfish flies that we're seeing were either not, they didn't look like a crayfish to me in profile, um, or they, the ones that did were like super difficult to tie. Um, and they had a lot of material involved and a lot of resins and stuff where this is really simple, creates a really lifelike profile first and foremost. Um, and then uh, uh, it's, Easy to cast too because it's all lightweight materials, mostly synthetics. Um, we're also then going to go over a uh, reefer fly or some, a reefer takeoff on it that I tie with a marabou tail instead of uh, like a chamois tail, um, which is really good on smallmouth. Um, this fly I find tied in a multitude of colors um, will work pretty much anywhere. It's very similar to a, like a bass jig uh, that you would use for like largemouth in conventional fishing. Um, a lot of these. Um, you know, that's where bass fishing is, you know, is really taken off was conventional. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to try to imitate those baits with the fly rod. Uh, and then one last pattern we'll rip through at the end uh, will be the Murdich Minnow, um, which is a pattern that I use all the time uh, for both smallmouth, largemouth. And depending on what size you tie it in, could be used for anything that eats bait fish. Um, so this pattern here, um, very simple pattern to tie, but it's got some amazing action in the water um, and uh, really easy to cast again, too. It's tied sparse. Um, cast into a wind really well and uh, does a really good job imitating a bait fish in whatever species of bait fish you just change the color or some material love it good. awesome cool so, so i guess we'll flip over. with uh start with Sorry, and kind of work down here <laughs> what's that oh go ahead switch switch over there i was just saying right. start with the hardest fly here the most time consuming at least and, and kind of work our way down all right, so my preferred choice of hook for this pattern, let me just try to center that a bit more there. Um, I really like uh, the Arex hooks. Uh, this is the Trout Predator Light uh, in a size one knot. Um, really awesome shape to the hook. Almost a little bit of a stinger bend to it on the bottom where the where the point comes around. Um, holds really well and uh, uh, for bass, it, it really penetrates easily. Super sharp hooks. I find I can hook bottom on these multiple times and I'll still check the point every time, but they don't seem to round off, which is pretty amazing if you ask me. All right. 
So first things first, um, I'm going to start with a, a black Viva 6 op thread. It's kind of my go-to for most bass flies. Oh, just move the camera a little bit. Um, we're going to start uh, just behind the eye, um, and we're going to tie down the shank, creating a good level thread base. Don't worry about touching turns. Going to trim this off. Okay. Um, there's a few parts to the head. Uh, when you look at a crayfish, um, they've got mouth parts, um, which are their mandibles that they eat with. Um, they've got their claws and they've got eyes and they're all very prominent. So we want to try to imitate all of those. I find those are key features that the fish key in on. So for the mouth parts, um, I use uh, Arctic Fox um, in orange. I find this flows really well in the water. If you look at a crayfish closely while well, it's just sitting on the bottom, um, the, it's always mouth parts in, are moving. Um, so this even when sitting still has really good movement in the water. I mean, creates a good natural taper as well. Again, it's all about profile. So as you're looking down the, the fly, um, you'll notice that it tapers towards a really good point, very similar to a natural. But what I do is when I trim off a bit, I'll actually remove the guard hairs and just kind of take the under fur is what I'm going for here. Okay. So I take off a pretty decent chunk, maybe quarter of like a pencil width or something like that. So you're left with this here. I then will just hold the base of the fibers and pull on the tips and try to remove, oh, didn't do that on camera, pull out the, uh, the guard hairs. Um, this creates, they're very, very soft under fur. Takes a couple pulls, it'll be good. And then you'll notice it creates um, a very nice taper as well. So we're going to tie this in here, a little bit of that. Tight. It's going to be about um, maybe half a shank's with length over top of the hook bend or past the hook bend. Mm -hmm. and tie that in. Um, and we're going to tie it slightly down the bend of the hook. This is, again, to imitate the profile of a crayfish when it's um, sitting on the bottom. Um, they often sit with their claws arched upright. Um, their legs are in the front, so it props the body up. Not uh, They don't really lay flat, which is something to key into, the fish key into. So you got that. And then um, to create a bit of a, a prop to help keep the um the exterior their eyes the, the mono eyes i'll use um separate separated i use like an extra large uh, estage chenille i'll only do a couple wraps of this so this stuff you don't need a lot of i'm going to trim off maybe an inch and we're only going to wrap it like twice so adds a little bit of flash but mostly it acts as a bit of a prop yeah and uh i know estage seems to be kind of a hard thing to come by around here but um a polar chenille would probably work for that as well, I imagine. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear you there. You're cutting out a little bit. Was that okay? Um, I know, I know that S does. It's hard, it's hard to find. Can be a little tricky to find around here, but like, a, I imagine a polar chenille or a Fritz may do the. Yeah, like a, a smaller medium polar chenille would do the trick. Yeah. All right, so I did just two wraps. Pinch that with your thumb and finger. One solid wrap around, and then just a couple more to secure it before you trim it. Mm -hmm. All right, and then I pull the fibers back and wrap slightly over the base of those to help guide the materials down, lock and, locking them in. All right, perfect. Then you're adding your mono eyes. Um, I, you can purchase them pre-made. You can make your own. Uh, these are ones that I make. I make a whole bunch of them. It's almost like a whole other video I'd want to do on these. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I use, uh, I burn the ends and then I slide a, a glass seed bead over top and then cover it in UV. So it creates kind of like, a, almost like a, well, it's hard to see in the photo or in the video, but there's almost like a clear portion and then a pupil. So it creates a very like uh, diverse or, um, a lot of bit of, a bit of depth of field, so a little bit different than just a black one. That's cool. It's kind of cool. It works really well. And uh, with shrimp eyes as well, I do them in orange and under uh, like sunlight, they actually kind of glow. So similar to shrimp eyes that they do at night, which is really cool. So good little tip. Mm -hmm. So I tie a bunch of these in advance. Um, I just use like 20 or 25 pound mono, burn the end, slide a seed bead on. And then uh, I use, where is it? Um, UV resin uh, to coat it. My preferred one, 
uh, as any of the, the solar res. Really like these guys here. You can buy them in these little tester packs or you can buy them in uh, the large tubes. Um, reason, really like solar res is it dries really tack free, which is nice. Yeah. Um, a lot of other, well, not a lot of other ones, but some others you have to you know, coat in uh, a really thin afterwards because that's the thick hard um, or using like head cement or lacquer. I find so yes. I want the eyes to go just about to the end of the mouth pieces. So it's, you can see that they're just beyond because again, you want the eyes to be super visible to the fish. It's a, it's a key part of what they're homing in on. So the eyes are very evident on a crayfish. So you want to make sure you can see them and tie one on in on each side of the hook shank, not on top. So. Uh. Sorry, Matt, the, the camera there is wobbling a, a good bit. Would you... Wobbling? Yeah. Is it tight to your body? Or are you sort of moving it around as you tell? Here, I, might un I got it plugged in. I might just unplug it. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> that should probably help. All right, cool. Yeah, that's better. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks for catching that. All right. A few wraps forward. Okay. So now I'm going to trim off these butts here. When you look at it, you want those eyes to be on either side of the mouthpiece. So you see they're pretty obvious, uh, big googly eyes there, but uh, that's what they're, they're super easy to see. So <clears throat> the next part is the, uh, the, well, I guess I should tie in the eyes. Oops. I'm going to tie in um, lead eyes about three quarters of the way down the shank towards the eye, not right. At, oh, sorry, I missed a step. Um, <laughs> I want to tie in the tail first and then the eyes over top. Hmm. The reason we do that is so that you, you can get this nice proportion where the tail runs underneath the hook eye, which is key. Okay. If you tie in the eyes first, it's really hard to get this tail uh, in, in the right angle. Right. So what I use for that uh, is the sculpting flash fiber or sculpting fiber works really well. Uh, any EP fiber would work, um, but I'm going to take out a pinch. One of my favorite materials to tie with for a lot of flies. Mm -hmm. It just looks so good. Yeah, it's like uh, anyone hasn't tied with it. It's, it's made by the um, uh, same company that makes uh, SF fiber uh, and a lot of other stuff. Yeah. It's very similar. It's like an EP with just a little flash mixed in. So, I mean, if somebody wants to take a little EP fiber and just brush in like some angel hair, I think he'd probably get pretty close. If exactly. Yeah. All right, just prepping this here. Bear with me. All right. So you're going to tie it in. It's going to be a little messy to start, but you're going to trim it uh, trim it to shape. So you want it to go past the hook eye, about half a hook shank length. Pinch it. And you want to make sure you continue to pinch while you throw your loose wraps around and you pull down. That way it rides on the top of the hook shank. You don't want it to spin around the shank. You do want this to be all just on the top. And I'm tying that into about where I cut off the mono just to help create a level base for the rest of the fly. All right. So we'll deal with the rest of that later. Um, at this point, put my lead or brass eyes on there, whatever you choose. Cross wrapping with the figure eight. Marty wanted to know if you'd ever be willing to do a video on just creating those eyes, the uh, mono ones. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure a lot of people would be curious on seeing that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a fun way to make them kind of add on to the you know customization of your own fly patterns. Um, regular mono eyes do work well. Uh, there's nothing wrong with them. You can buy them pre-made. Um, I find when you make your own, you can never get the eye big enough, like unless you're using like 50 pound mono. Yeah. Um, so using that was a technique I, I picked up and works really well. Okay, so the eyes are secured on there. I'm not going to mess with those anymore. We're going to wrap back down to basically where the eyes were last tied in at the just above the bend of the hook. And we are going to tie in a brush. Uh, you can use a dubbing loop for this uh, make or, or a brush. The brush I have here um, is uh, actually a mix of coyote under fur um, and uh, tan ice dub. Uh, so there's a little, not much ice dub. You don't want a lot, um, but you, you do want a little bit of flash. Um, the main reason I use 
coyote under fur is when you look at a crayfish and you flip it over, their bellies are much lighter than their back every time. Uh, or most of the ones that I, in the area I fish anyways, um, in the area around like Simcoe and Georgian Bay, there's a lot of rusty crayfish in the water and the bottoms of the, of the, um, their carapace are, uh, are very light colored compared to the back. Um, so we use a nice light flowing material like this, just to add extra movement. Um, crayfish have many legs. I think they've got like six legs and then on their sides and then they've got their claws. Right. So this can imitate legs. It can imitate their gills breathing. It can imitate a lot of things. And when it's stripped through the water, it pulls backwards really nice for nice uh, hydrodynamic uh, uh, proportions. So you're going to tie that in. Right. Sorry, Matt. Um, yep. If uh, if somebody was wanting that brush, that, that's one that you built yourself, right? Sorry. Yes, correct. I built that brush myself. Yeah. Um, there's I mean, Chris, I'm sure you guys have quite a few you can recommend in the shop if you guys yeah i think the you know what the the best one would be um the polar fiber brushes and uh, yeah there's like a camel and tan color that would be actually pretty close but otherwise it's just a matter of either building your own brush or you're saying beforehand you you built that brush just because you didn't want to spend too much time today yeah a big dubbing loop but yeah a lot of the time I use a dubbing loop with this material, um, but to help speed up the tie and get three flies in today, uh, I, I did make a brush. It, it's no different. If you, I would just maybe use a bit of a heavier thread to for your dubbing brush, maybe just to increase the durability. Like if you went with a 100 Denier GSP or something like that, um, that way it'll stand up a little longer uh, than just the six aught thread. Sure. This is probably the point of the fly that would be the most fragile if you use six aught. Um, because not only do the bass love this, I've cut lots of pike on this and uh, and all that stuff as well. Sorry. So um, now that we've wrapped that in, it's nice and secure. Uh, I'm going to tie in the claws uh, at this point. Um, and that way this will help keep them separated, the brush. So for the claws, uh, do, 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 I'm going to use um, like barred crazy legs, um, these rubber silicone legs, really good, lots of movement. They float in the water. So when that fly stops, um, they really prop up in like a fighting position. Um, I use about a half a hank for each claw. So this has been cut in half uh, and I'm gonna tie it in. So I'm gonna clip off the ends because they're welded at the end. And you want these claws to be about the total length of the fly. So from the tail to the eyes roughly, there we go. So you're gonna tie them in like the eyes on each side of the hook. Um, just a couple easy wraps and then I'm gonna trim it just to make life easy for me. Go. All right, now I'm gonna tie those down pretty securely because they do have a funny way of falling out. So you wanna make sure you wrap those in. Then to make sure they sit in the right orientation, I do pull them down and I give them a couple of wraps just around the base oh, yeah. of the claw. Just to help keep them together and stop them from rolling around the shank. That's like four wraps I think I just did. Uh, and then I tie in. So that keeps them from laying flat to propping them out to the side a little bit and keeping them uh, as two independent claws. That's what I'm going for. So then we'll do the same on the other side, trying to match the length pretty close. I can always trim it later. And we're trimming off these butts here. All right. And we'll do the same by rotating the vise towards me. A little bit finicky, but you get the idea. That was just sort of loose wraps. I imagine if you're pulled tighter, you might risk cutting the legs. Sorry? Oh, I, I imagine those were sort of looser wraps. If you had pulled tight, you'd probably risk cutting the legs. Yes, I should mention, you're right. Um, they're not super tight wraps. They're like half the pressure that I would use to normally tie any other fly. So yeah, you will cut that silicone with the, the thinner thread for sure. Um, then with the brush, I'm going to wrap forward. Um, this, these do not need to be touching turns. In fact, like I try to purposely keep it sparse um, because when it's in the water, if you have too much material, um, it's just not going to flow right. It's going to mat down. So I might put like four or five millimeters of 
space in between each wrap because this material fills in really well. Coyote underfur is like an awesome material. That it is. All right. So you get to the eyes, twist it around your thread, twist the brush around your thread and then wrap down. It's a good way to keep it where you want it. And then take an old pair of scissors and trim your wire away. Okay. There we go. So we're about 90% of the way there. Now we're gonna do um, the top of the carapace. And this is where it imitates a lot of saltwater shrimp patterns. Again, using a similar to like an EP brush or EP fiber, I'm sorry. Uh, this is again gonna use the sculpting fiber just cause it's the same as the tail. Clamp that down. Right now, I mean, it, it would probably work on its own, but I do like the imitation or by adding the sculpting fiber, I like the way it really shows a shell. Uh, and that's super important for these fish too. So put out about a little bit more than a pencil width of the sculpting fiber. You're gonna cut a lot of it off when you're trimming it to shape. Um, so go a little bit heavier because you do want it to be tight at the tail or, or pretty heavy at the tail and then uh, tapering towards the head of the fly. All right, so it's kind of what I got here. Uh, it's definitely longer than the fly. Uh, that's on purpose. Um, we're going to tie in just past the eyes here. We're going to go bring it, bring the thread wraps over. Do a couple wraps here just to position it. Now I've got enough room there. It's not right tight to the eye, like you'll see some lead eyes. It's got about, I don't know, three or four mils there to tie in the the, the shell, which is important. If you tie the lead the lead eyes too close to the uh, the eye, you'll just crowd the eye or fly and you'll never get the shell trim to shape. So we're going to put that on top and we're going to lash that one down again by holding the material to make sure it stays put. I'm going to pull that material back. I'm actually going to try to trim it now. We'll do a few more wraps. Try and trim it close. There we go. Okay, there we go. So at this point, the fly's tied. Now it just comes down to giving it a little bit of a haircut and using some UV resin and some Sharpies. All right, a couple whip finishes. All right, so now what we're trying to go for on the profile, as you see, it's really squared up right now. I want to trim it um, on my vice out of the way to do this. Uh, I'm going to trim the fly so it tapers towards a point on each side and then also on the bottom. You want the top to remain pretty much straight, um, but you do want to trim it so it's just at about um, the hook or the eye length of the fly. So you're going to pull those fibers, uh, trim that just to about the eye, let those fall away. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the brush or the uh, fibers flat by brushing them with my fingers. And then I'm gonna take my scissors uh, at about a centimeter away from the lead eyes and start trimming on a maybe a 30 degree angle. Definitely want some pretty sharp scissors doing this. I think I need to get some new ones. <laughs> there we go, getting there. And we're gonna do the same on this side. All right, we're starting to get that shape. You can see uh, what a crayfish would look like. Then the key is doing it underneath as well. So don't cut your claws off. Pull the fibers towards you in, in like a vertical plane at this point now. Once you had you had them horizontal, now try to cut them underneath here. A little bit of a steeper angle by the looks of it. I guess you try to kind of thin that out a bit. Sorry? A little bit of a steeper angle on that cut, kind of trying to... Yeah, I would say that one's like a, like a nice 60 degree cut or something. You want that to lay flat against the uh, undershell or underbody when it when it's stripped. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's pretty close. That's kind of what we're going for. So you can see the front profile here is tapered to a point. Underneath, it lays flat. 
along the belly. Uh, and now the last step of this is to, well, second last step, I guess, is to do the tail. It can be a little bit messy at this point, but what I like to use um, for creating this tail, which will act like a lip. Um, again, uh, I'm not the first one to use a, a lip on a fly. Uh, Bob Popovic's uh, kind of invented uh, lipped patterns. Um, so uh, I, I definitely give him credit for being the, the first one to do something like this. Um, or he uses like a, a really hard two-part epoxy to create a very stiff lip. This one, I want it to be soft. When, the, when I strip, I want the tail to fold underneath. Um, but it does hit the eyes and then causes the fly to wobble really tight on every strip. Um, also making sure to impart action with your rod tip. That's key. So when we're stripping the streamer. So for this, I'm going to use uh, solar res like the flex. UV cure flex, yep. really good stuff. Uh, I'm going to put in a little at the tip and just brush it throughout the tail. Trying to make sure you get all the fibers. It's going to be messy. It's got to accept it. <laughs> okay, so that's saturated there. I'm going to just, you can use your um, bodkin to help distribute it too. I just like smearing it with my fingers, not going to lie. I get a much tighter, more consistent coverage. Splay those out. And the crayfish tail isn't uniform, round. It's got little bumps in it, so the tips will be ragged and that's okay. There we go. Okay. And you're going to hit that with your UV light. It'll take long, just a couple seconds per side. Already getting there. All right. Then you're going to take your same scissors uh, and you're going to trim this into a bit of a spherical shape be perfect but that's the idea there so that'll fold down on the strip every time which is nice so perfect then just to finish it off um you want to make sure that it looks like a segmented body because crayfish have segmented bodies uh, the tail as well so i line the edges with a black sharpie and then i put a few lines down the middle um and then you want to put your shell markings depending on the size of your fly I usually try to squeeze on like four of them per per fly. So on this one's a size one odd, I'd probably space them apart five or six millimeters with the Sharpie. And then down on the back side. By no means a science to this. <laughs> now are you working on are you trying to create a sort of a tapered effect with that uh, that barring where you're spacing the the bars out progressively? Yeah. Well, kind of. You know, I'm using the tip of the point marker to get to the base. And then as I go up the back, I, I drag the marker itself. I use the tip and then roll into it. And that creates, you can see there's a bit of a, a taper for sure. So that, I usually go right to the hook point. So this one's actually got three bars. That'll work. Um, and we'll go down the other side with just the tip, just to create that. So a little bit of head cement on the thread wraps and you'd be done. So again, this one's all about profile. Um, see that sitting there? It really creates a crayfish-like profile, but because these materials are so hollow and soft, it casts really easy. It doesn't plop loud on the water. Uh, it's pretty soft. So if you're sight fishing for bass, it's a good option. Um, oops, just wanna trim the claws so they're roughly the same length. There we go. And yeah, that's the first one, my crazy cray. That's great. Dances wow. along pretty well. So fishy. Cool, any questions? No, I think you explained it great. I think that came through very nice. Cool. There it is. All right. Cool. Awesome. Now do us, one of my favorites, for sure. Do us a favor on the next one and don't explain it so well so we get some questions in the chat. Sorry, what's what? On the next one, don't explain things so well so we get some questions in the chat. Okay, cool. Also, <laughs> <laughs> I'll do I'm that. Uh, awesome. Okay, next one we're going to do is uh, the Reaper style fly. Again, this one's deadly pretty much anywhere bass swim. I think you could uh, tie this in any size and, uh, and, and likely catch most species of fish on it. Um, so it is it to imitate like a bass jig, spinner bait, maybe something like that as well with the skirt. Uh, pulls really well. You can fish it on the bottom. You can fish it on the strip. Um, 
you can tie it big. It works really well for pike. You can tie it small. I haven't used it, but I'm sure it would work well for trout. Um, there's a lot of redfish flies that are similar too. Uh, black and purple is a really good all around, nice contrasting color um, that imitates a lot of things. So first things first, um, for this fly, I'm going to use um, the Gamma Gats to B10S hook. I really like that one for this fly. However, I do something a little different to it. I do a little kink in the eye. I put it in my vise and I drop it down about 45 degrees. Uh, there are hooks on the market that have a 45 degree bend on them. Uh, I'm, I haven't really found, uh, it's hard to find them right now, um, but this I've always done it with this hook and I haven't uh, had any hooks break or anything. You don't bend it too much. Like that's key. You put it in there, bend slow. You're going to be fine. Um, I think you guys have a predator 45 degree hook right now yeah, in the shop. I was looking at that online, but yeah. not in. Uh, I think this is like a size like one. It might so not have quite that, pretty small. They want to tie a large one. Yeah, there's the A Rex. Um, yeah, 45s that that would work well. Or um, I, we don't have the B2S's, but the Mustad C52S is a very similar hook. Should, I think you should be able to get away with bending that one too. If I do, cool. Do enough with Mustads. All right, um, we're gonna use. The same thread I was using before, uh, black six aught Levis thread, nice and strong. Um, starting it just at the bend here, where I've made that kink, and going to the back of the fly. One thing I love about bass flies is they don't need to be overly complicated. Um, a lot of these are impressionistic, and it's all about you know making sure that the pattern represents many species, many things, many types of forage. So this fly, I think, only has. Three materials, if you four materials with the thread, so really simple, um, and it works pretty much everywhere. For the tail, uh, a sparse piece of black marabou. For this one, again, you can use whatever pattern or whatever color you like. I've done very well on this in olive. Um, I've done well on it in white. Uh, if you strip it like a like a bait fish, um, works really well. If you see people catching fish on spinner baits and things like that, but uh, I like the blacks, olives, browns, um, fish along the bottom. Uh, just imitate like a, a crayfish profile, uh, could be like a leech profile, could be just looks buggy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's super important. So the tail is going to be slightly longer than the overall hook. Uh, we're going to tie it about one and a quarter lengths of the hook. Tying it in. And I try to wrap the marabou down the shank loosely just to help create profile. And then I'll come over it tighter with thread wraps. Just so that I have an even base to work with. So Matt, these are both sort of kind of crayfish-like patterns. Do you have different um, sort of philosophies on fishing each and when you might fish one over the other? Uh, I like to play with patterns and fish many things until I find something that works. Um, yeah, I mean, there are probably... You know, better reasons to fish a dark pattern over a light pattern on, on days. Um, I think, especially with crayfish flies, uh, I like fishing them in shallow water um, that, you know, one to four or five feet deep. Um, when I start getting out deeper into open water on shoals and rocky points, I like fishing bait fish patterns. I'm not saying a crayfish pattern won't work, but they work really well along the bottom and having bottom contact with your fly is super important. It's harder to do that in deeper water. You can do it with a full like type seven line, no problem. Um, but mostly when I'm bass fishing, I carry, you know, a, a seven weight or an eight weight with interchangeable tips um, to play with the depth I'm fishing. Um, plus, I like, you know, especially largemouth, I find they they really like those muddy bays, lots of weeds. Uh, and then you can fish these on shallow rocky points for smallmouth too. But if you're on open water and you know fish are chasing bait fish, that's when I would switch to like a white pattern, maybe white and silver or depending on the bait fish in your lake, I should say. Uh, it could be perch or the predominant forage. So then you want to fish something that's a little bit olive and yellow. Um, but yeah, I mean, I try many things until, you know, you, you key in on the biggest thing is, you know, having confidence in your fly. Um, as a, you know, I grew up conventional fishing and specifically for bass uh, when I was younger. Um, and <laughs> I, I, I would pretty much throw a five inch pumpkin seed Senko everywhere. <laughs> it didn't matter. Right. So, you, you know, you, and that's your confidence. I call it a fish. So my confidence flies are these ones. And, uh, yeah, you know, I kind of kind of fish them anywhere until I find one that works for the day. But don't be ready to change it up. Keep it, keep it, keep it, uh, keep fluid and always changing it throughout the day. Cool. All right. So I'm gonna make a dubbing loop here for the body. Now, the key with um, 
the material I use for the body here is I use uh, purple semi seal and the peacock ice dub mixed together That's to create a nice kind of purpley black body. I would say imitate you know whatever forge you have. So if I'm using a purple and black fly, I'm trying to make a purple and black body. Um, if you're using white, you know use use for for this I would probably use uh, white white or the pearl ice ice dub and uh, some of the silver ice dub mixed in to create a nice brush. Um, again, keep changing until you find one that looks good. A lot of these flies can be crazy colors and, and, and that can also just elect an aggression strike from a, from a bass. A lot of the time it's again, impression and fishing it well. So with this one, I'm going to add pretty long brush cause I want it to cover the whole body. I'm going to pick out the fibers, slide them up. I forgot my dubbing wax at the bench, so see how this works. Looks like it's working pretty well. I'm sure it'll be fine. Yeah. Might be a little bit tricky, might be falling out of the thread on me. Pretty long brush. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make this probably a total of six inches. Um, and before drop it, close it off by pinching the two loops so you don't lose anything. Uh, and then you can start your spin. So I'll give your bobbin, a, I usually pinch the thread together, give the bobbin a lot of spin or the, uh, sorry, the dubbing loop tool, a bunch of spins in your hand and then kind of slowly let it go and it'll spin up nice for you. Beautiful. And do that a few times. That gives you a controlled spin too. So you're not getting it all matted down. All right. And then hit it with your brush, comb everything out. You can use your bodkin to pick it out. Tease those fibers away. You really want to get a, a thin profile underneath these hairs. You don't want it to be super thick. Um, the, the thinner you can get the, the core of this, of a, of a brush or a dubbing loop, the stronger it'll be. If you have lots of thick parts, it's just going to fall out because the dubbing's not actually kind of pinched between the thread very well. Um, and then I'm just going to start palmering this forward and I'm going to stop just beyond the, um, the bend here so I can put in the eyes, uh, and start the skirt as well. And then I'll palmer that through the skirt and the end skirting material, I should say. Nice. Now I know you're saying you fish, uh, lakes a lot more than you do rivers for bass, but, uh, we have one, Patrick was wondering, uh, if you could break down so your preferred line, leader, and potential a any added weight that you'd use for fishing crayfish and rivers. Sorry, you're, you're really cutting out, but I think I got line, leader. <laughs> like, is that what I heard? Yeah, line, leader, and potential added weight for fishing crayfish and rivers. Sure, yeah. Um, one of my favorite lines is any like the Rio Bass smallmouth or the Bass line. It turns flies over really easy. These are heavy flies with lots of weight. Um, so having a, a nice bass floating line is key. Um, and then I play with um, lots of tips. So I like using an intermediate or a type three or type five sink tip. Uh, poly leaders work really well. It doesn't need to be heavy. You're casting these with a single hand rod. So you do want it to be relatively light. Um, I also tie the flies in multiple weights. So I'll use this one. I'm gonna tie with brass eyes. Um, I'll tie them with lead eyes. Um, you can slip tungsten beads in on the shank as well to get extra weight. Um, and then, you know, when you're tying your leader, um, with any sinking fly, I like to keep my leader pretty short. Um, I like to keep it, you know, four or five feet maybe with these, um, that way you have more direct contact with your fly, which is key. Uh, if you have a long leader, it can be easy to have a little bit of slack in your leader and your sink tip will sink well before your fly does. And then it just doesn't make a nice level platform when you strip it because you want the sink tip to be close to the bottom when you strip it, that the fly moves horizontal along the bottom, which is really key. Um, if you have it floating, having the, you know, the yo-yo effect is good too, sometimes with certain flies, but I find with the crayfish, they don't usually come up off the bottom too much. They kind of skitter along the bottom. So making sure that it gets down. Um, I would probably use uh, like a decent butt material, uh, like a 20 or 25 pound butt with 10 to 12 pounds, like a tippet tied to that. Something that'll turn it over nice and quick. Um, fluorocarbon or mono, I haven't noticed too much of a difference myself, 
Um, and if you find you're not contacting bottom, don't be afraid to crimp on a split shot right in front of the fly. Um, that can be really good. I, you know, I usually tie these on with a loop knot uh, to give it extra action. And if you crimp on like a BB size or an AB size split shot right in front of the knot, it'll act a lot like a jig and it'll cause that fly to undulate really well in the water. That helps get you down as well. So there's options, you can play with it. So, and then in my box, I know which ones are tied uh, with brass eyes, which ones are lead, which ones have tungsten, uh, and then uh, like on each row, and then uh, throw in a pack of split shot for good measure if you just can't get down. <laughs> nice. All right. So then the eyes are going to go on this 45 degree bend here. And the reason we do that is to allow it to sit on the bottom with a slightly upward orientation. Again, similar to that crayfish fly I tied before, uh, you want the, that marabou to be uh, kind of just dancing up on off the bottom on an angle. If it lays completely flat, it can get lost there on the bottom for sure. So we've tied the eyes in uh, with a figure of eight, and then I always go around the base of the eyes. So I can do it on this angle so you can see it a bit better. That, and then give it a nice pull. That helps really lock the eyes in. They won't pivot on you, nice and secure. All right, now for this one, uh, again, I'm gonna take, this is like a two colored silicone leg. So uh, purple and black, maybe half a hank, kind of what we're going for again. All right. And then I take, I want this, uh, I don't want the whole skirt to be purple. I want it to be black and purple. So I'm going to cut about half of this purple material off of it. Just so the tips are purple. All right. I'm going to tie this on top of the lead eyes, but very loosely. Because you want to tease the material around them by pulling the fibers just to orientate them properly. Then I'm gonna give it a trim with, I'm gonna leave some excess here because I want to um, make sure it's wrapped down nice and secure. It doesn't fall off on you. I'm gonna trim this one up again here. So again, only about half the color that you're looking for. And then I'm gonna rotate that around just we're gonna do the same on the top of the hook. Make sure your fibers are pretty much even. And again, just two loose wraps. And then I trim it. And at this point, you just wanna take them again and just kinda of tease them around so you get a nice 360 degree coverage. All right, so I'm gonna put one more wrap in for good measure just so I don't lose it all. Spin the vise back. All right, pull those fibers forward. And you got this messy brush here. I'm gonna wrap that just to cover those butt ends. And you can really pull hard on this now because you, with the thread, you likely cut the silicone. When it's got some dubbing on it, you can get extra tension on it. It's not gonna pull. All right, you're gonna put in you, one. You don't find two, that uh, take... three wraps. Yeah, go ahead. All right, you don't find taking that uh, dubbing loop off of the the. Um tool there and like leave it hanging it doesn't unwind itself and become all loose once you got it nice and tight i don't usually find it does um that i mean the tool fell off <laughs> and it closed the loop on me so i try to keep it on usually but uh that time it kind of failed me but it still still did all right Fair enough. Uh, and then you're really going to go to town with your brush and really coax out these fibers because they've matted down once you wrap them This is gonna act like a bit of a prop just to keep those silicone legs from, you know, this is between too streamlined, you want that nice profile. All right, you're gonna fold those back, fold the, uh, the top side or the underside of the hook, which will be the top side when it's fishing, back, pinch them off and pull your thread forward and do a couple wraps in front, again, to help orientate the thread or the, uh, the legs. And then I go just in front of the eye, that's what I'm going to do. Just a three wrap whip finish. I usually do two of them. And trim it off. So a messy looking fly, but does it ever catch? <laughs> you can throw rattles in on this as well if you want for an extra little entice. Um, it's hard to get a rattle that'll fit one of these size one hooks uh, very well. If you tie a little bit bigger, I'm um, using some 
rattles are a good option. So yeah, Reaper. It's a kind of a take on the Reaper. The re traditional one has a from Rainey's has a chamois tail, um, but with the Marabou, I think when it just sits on the bottom, it's just constantly moving and looks really good. Yeah, that's great. And you can just cool. imagine like you can leave that thing right on bottom and not move it, and it'll be all over the place still. Yeah, you don't have to move it, and it's moving for you. Mm -hmm. And that's a, it's a great one for rivers too. This one, um, not only still water. Um, you know, if you let that swing in the current too, uh, it, it'll it'll move really nicely for you. Yeah. Okay. How are we doing there, Chris? Anything? Good questions or anything? No. Yeah, you, you got it there. We had uh, one from uh, Mitch earlier asking about um, why the bend, but I think that got answered pretty well there. Stand up effect. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Then we'll move on to one of my favorite bait fish patterns. I love this thing. Um, I think a lot of people know this fly. Um, you hear about it a lot, but the Murdich minnow, um, I think it works for any species of fish that eats bait fish, um, but uh, works really well for bass, I think. Uh, so this one, I'm actually using the Gamagatsu like saltwater. It's a SC15 um, it's coated hook. Uh, I like the wide gap on it, kind of a stinger shape, but short shank. Yeah. Uh, I don't want the shank to be too long because I, I want the head to be fairly short. And this is a lot of tail on this fly that moves really seductively. So let's jump into it. And I'm going to use six out of thread. I would probably just switch to white, but um, I'm going to color the back of this fly black. So I'm going to keep with the black thread. It'll be fine because it'll blend into the eye or the uh, the head of your fly really well. Did you have a, a finished one there for us, Matt? I think I saw one earlier there. So oh, what? Sorry? Oh, did you have that finished fly there? Just so we can see what we're working. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I would start every other one. Um, this is my take on the Murdoch Minnow. You can see it. Yeah. Um, let's see. Focus. There we go. Um, you can see it's 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 got like it's kind of multiple levels. It's got your nice bait fish profile on the side, but then it's got these two wings on the back that help create a dodging side to side movement. Um, really. Oh, there we go. A little bit more in focus. Um, simple pattern, but man, does it ever work? Uh, it walks the dog on every strip. Um, the tail is bucktail, and uh, I got I, I throw in a little hack on each side to create a little bit more bar like color, maybe a lateral line. Uh, you can play with it. Um, it's a nice platform to tie any bait fish style off of. Um, and I've seen every variation of this, so <laughs> it's one of those slides everyone kind of takes and makes their own, too. I'm sure you'd agree. Yeah, absolutely. So, oh, okay. yeah. Uh, to start, uh, wrap your thread down to the bend of the hook. Uh, the tail is uh, is a very sparse bucktail. Uh, make sure you're not tying in too much. That's key with this. You want it to be flowy. Um, so I usually take for this style of fly thread like towards the or hair towards the tip of the the tail. A little softer. It doesn't flare as much as the base. There's good use is for like the base of the tail. Like if you're tying musky flies as you're trying to get that profile towards the head of like a buford or something, it pops up really nice. But the soft towards the tip, uh, the fibers are softer and they're not hollow. So they'll, they'll flow really well in your fly. So I'm gonna take off uh, a little bit, not, not going heavy on this, like I said. Um, we do want it thin. Like maybe you know, 20 fibers or something. There's not a lot here. Um, and then I try to, if I have like one or two random long ones, I try to take them out. Um, I should also mention one way that I try to take the hair off the bucktail, uh, which really helps keep the fibers semi-aligned, um, is I'll grab my portion of hair and I'll pull it back towards the base of the tail. And that allows your tips to kind of get a little bit more aligned as if, because now you're cutting them at a different height on each one. You do waste a little bit of the base material, but that's okay. It kind of starts off that way. And then the uh, the material itself, the way the hair grows, like the bucktail is actually folded in half around a bone on this. So you get sh stiffer hair with more color variation, the more you go around the back of the, the tail. So the closer to the middle here you get, there's the softest, easiest to tie with. All right. So I've got my hair. This is going to be a pretty long tail on this fly, like maybe three or four times the length of the hook. Uh, so just right there like that. Tying on top of the hook uh, is important with a couple of wraps here. Uh, and then what I do is before you go down nice and tight, just give it a little wiggle and it'll go all the way around. When you say all the way around, all the way around the top, or you want it going all the way around like to the bottom as well? 
I have it around like the shank just to create a bit of a that way it's it creates a nice taper there. Yep. You can the cool thing about how you, however you hold bucktail with your thumb and finger, you can you can change the shape of it so easily. If you push it on it on it like this when you're tying in, you can get it just on the sides. If you loose wrap and spin it, it's 360. You can hold it with three fingers and you can kind of create a triangle like taper of the material. It's really, I mean, one of the older materials we still tie with, but it's it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Then I tie in uh, silver flash taboo uh, over the top, um, slightly longer than the bucktail that I have there. And this, don't be too afraid to go a little heavier with flash than you might want to. Flash is part of this fly. So this one's pretty heavy flash. There we go. So we're gonna go slightly longer than the total length of the tail. And we're gonna to try to keep the flash boo up on top of the shank. We want it all on the back of the fly. And I'm gonna just level those tips off real quick, but they're gonna still extend past the bucktail. All right, so there we go, that's that. And then before I move on from the tail, I'm gonna add just uh, some grizzly saddle or a neck hackle here, just a couple on the side to give me that profile I'm looking for. Just gives it the kind of a lateral line look and Breaks things up a bit. I mean, grizzly hackle just looks so good in the water. Can't mess with that stuff. And you want it to be the same length as the bucktail. So you're going to test it, and then you're just going to strip those fibers back, and drop them on your bench. And these are going to go on the sides. Uh, so you're going to push along the hook with your index finger on the back of the hook, and you're going to push pretty hard when you do a wrap or two, and then give it a nice pull every two wraps. It stops it from spinning, and it just lays flat. Like that's like the trickiest part, I think, of that is trying to get the feather to sit properly. Mm. This fly is really overall very simple. And if somebody, like, this is your little tweak out, which I love, I think this is really good looking. But if somebody wanted to make this even simpler, the original didn't have this hackle. So it's just like bucktail, flat, mm -hmm. EP. Right. Totally. Yeah. There we go. Two pieces of hackle. The bucktail helps keep the hackle straight. That's inside of there. You got the nice flat profile of a bait fish. Um, and if you look at the top of a bait fish or the bottom, you know they taper towards the tail. Uh, so the head on this will be head and body will be kind of bulky, but tapering down. It kind of is narrow, gets wider, and then tapers down narrow again, just like a bait fish would. So from the side profile, it's tapering right, and then also on top and bottom. That's something I think. Um, again, going back to Bob Popovics, was he really was cautious with when tying his flies was ensuring that the profile was 360 degrees around the shank because uh, the fish can come at it from any way yeah very true cool there's that and then uh where did I... for the uh <clears throat> for like the, the the fins or the wings on the side i'm going to use a, an ep fiber this really helps the fly dart left and right on each strip um and trim off pretty hefty portion. All right, hit my light. There we go. So you're going to tie one side just about a quarter inch back from the back from the bend of the hook um, on the side of the hook, and then you're going to go to the other side with the other fin. Um, this is what gives the fly all of the action in the water. So a couple loose wraps. Make sure you're positioned right. Give a direct pull straight down with your bobbin. If you try to pull with your bobbin like this, you're gonna cut your thread almost every time. Uh, so straight pull is always important. All right, and then you're gonna fan those out. Make sure, yeah, perfect. Keep those flash fibers because you're gonna use those later. Don't trim them off. All right, and then with the remaining, we're gonna go to other side of the fly and we're going to try to match that with again two or three loose wraps and then a straight pull perfect 
All right, now to help divide these so that they stay like wings right now, they are on either side of the shanks, so they probably will. I'm gonna take that flash that is left over, pull it back and help nestle it between the fibers, and give it a few wraps. And then I'm just gonna trim it so those tips are even. One other variation of this I'll do is the first material I tie in um, under the shank is like red flash, red flash boon, it creates like a nice little target for the fish for sure. That's, that's cool. So that's the profile we're kind of looking for on the top. Trim those errant fibers if you want. It's not, doesn't have to be perfect. All right, wrap that down. Okay, and then I'm gonna use some large or extra large. This is Estaz again, but you could use cactus chenille or polar chenille if you wanted um, for the same or similar look. I like using it a little bit longer uh, than I would say. I think I actually have some of the old, a little bit of the other, a lot of people use this, like this, like a cactus chenille, like um, it's, it's a little bit uh, smaller diameter, but I like using the large or the extra large because that way I can trim it to shape a little bit and create a nice minnow-like profile. And I said, everyone does this fly slightly different. So tie it in. And then I'm gonna try to just build a bit of a taper towards the head here with thread. Just for two reasons. I mean, a bait fish naturally tapers towards the midsection. Um, and it also helps you wrap your puller, your, your chenille, your uh, estaz a little bit easier down the shank. Takes a while to build up though with just this thinner thread. Now, uh, Mike was asking if there was an alternate to the EP fibers um, sculpting flash, I guess, would be a good one. And you could use... Yep, sculpting flash would be perfect. Yeah, mind you, I, I think EP is more widely available. We certainly have lots here. Yeah. Um, you, you want something with, like, a bit of push, a little stiffness, I would say, but then also kind of yeah. soft, so it flares, right? Would you agree? Definitely, I agree with you there. Like, SF fiber, in my mind, wouldn't be a great option. Uh, you know, just to name another synthetic, because it it's it doesn't flare as much. It's not as soft. Um, yeah. We could maybe use this, maybe like a natural. You could maybe use some cut bucktail ends. That might work. Yeah, you could do cut bucktail. Yeah, it's it's really all just for the action of the fly. Like it, it, it kind of blends right in. You don't really see it too much. Yeah. Uh, unless you're looking at it from above or below. But yeah, cut bucktail would be a great option. It might be even it might be uh, a little bit more buoyant too, and keep it towards the surface. Yeah. Which could be. A good bonus for fish that are really tar uh, targeting schooling bait fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a bunch of ways you could do it, Mike. But yeah, try and find something that's got some stiffness and some flair to it, just to to get the action. All right, I made just the right amount. <laughs> She's almost cut myself short. Very material. Big. Okay, perfect. And then we're just gonna tie that in. Cool. Hold that back, just secure it, and then I'll just trim off the extra. Okay, so it's a little bit wild right now. Um, I mean, you could definitely leave it like that and it would catch fish. Um, I personally like it a little bit more shaped. Just finish this off. So I'm going to just take my dubbing brush, take all my ice dub out of it from earlier. Just give this stuff a brush forward. Really, then you can sculpt it really well. So I'm going to take it down. Um, first off, I'm going to try to square it up on the back. Pulling the EPA out of the way so you don't trim it. And then I'm going to trim the sides. I really want to just kind of make a bit of a rectangle out of it right now. Nothing too hard, nothing too fancy. And then the same with the bottom. All right, brush that out of the way. And then you kind of just want to play with the head, sculpt it a little bit. Just create a bit more of a bait fish kind of shape. All right, looking all right. Okay. 
a couple of errant fibers there seem to cut out of the way. This has a nice iridescent pearl shimmer, like a lot of bait fish do. Um, and then one thing that I think is uh, super key um, with all um, bait fish flies is, is putting eyes on them. Uh, I think that's a big target for a lot of fish. They, they aim right at the eye. Um, so I'm gonna put a couple eyes on there. I really like the uh, the Living Eye series, uh, which is really cool. They look really nice. Uh, I think that's Fish Skull. I think they make them. Yeah. Um, don't have the package on me right now. Um, so I would usually use super glue to put them on, but it looks like I left that at my bench. <laughs> We're gonna use a little bit of UV here just to kick it in. I have like big eyes on my on my bait fish flies. I don't know. I'm with you. Yeah. I think it's, it's a nice target. What's that? It's a nice target. Yeah, big target. Yeah. Wide eyed. They look scared, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um do the one other eye. In uh, when I act, I would highly recommend super glue for this stage. I just uh, don't have it right next to me right now. I left it on my bench yeah. downstairs. Um, but in a pinch, this works just for demo purposes. Um, yeah, probably not. It's not thing. They they wouldn't last very long. No. I did that. All right, uh, and then to finish it, um, bait fish are usually darker on the top than they are at the bottom. So position the fly towards you. Hit it with a. Sharpie down the middle. Trying to get a nice profile there. So, and that would be finished Murdish minnow pattern. Yeah. That one's a little bit bulky, I would think, which creates, you can see though, that nice narrow taper getting wider and then tapering down again towards the tail. Um, it, the big thing with this one is it pushes a lot of water. So uh, it, it, it vibrates a lot in this water. It uh, keys it, helps the fish key in on it. Instead of it slipping through the water super easily, like if you look at that profile, it really swims left to right. And I think uh, that's why it works so well. There's definitely more realistic bait fish patterns out there, but I catch so many fish on this fly, so many bass. Um, yeah. Yeah. I can't go wrong with it. Make, it. make a trade, you know, action over realism any day. Yeah. And then when I <clears throat> fish this pattern, I should say, uh, with a lot of streamers, I see a lot of people that, um, that, that'll that cast and just strip. Um, work the rod tip. So usually there's two stages to casting a streamer or fishing a streamer. You cast it out there. You're going to cast and strip, and it's not at the same time. It's you're going to, or you're going to jerk it and then strip it. It's not at the same time. So cast, jerk, then strip in the slack. Jerk with the rod tip, strip in the slack. Um, and that'll cause the fly to really dart left and right. Yeah. Very key. Yeah. Uh, if you just strip, It'll move, but not as uh, seductively, I guess, as uh, properly working your fly rod. Yeah, I think the most successful streamer anglers, if you watch, again, conventional anglers fishing bait fish patterns, they use the rod a lot to imitate impart action. Um, so we should be doing the same. Yeah, absolutely agree. And I think, yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to like giving the line flat. I don't know if you agree. Like, you know, when you when you jerk the rod, if you imagine. You know, when you pause it, you aren't taking in line. So you kind of create slack, which then gets picked up afterwards. And in the interim, the, the right. fly kind of drifts, right? So it kind of... Exactly. Walk the dog. Look. It's a yeah, great... Yeah, time. that's those are my uh, three flies. Cool. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Mike. Oh, and Mike, definitely that thing would, would kill on trout too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, we didn't go. Cool. We didn't cover it in the uh, the intro there. I forgot. But um, just to recap, if you guys aren't familiar, Matt is an instructor and a guide with us here at Drift, um, and we'll be uh, offering days out for for carp, for bass, for trout, for whatever else he 
Steelhead, I'm sure. Uh, other stuff he <laughs> wants to target this year. So yeah, with all, all species, you know, I don't dis- <laughs> I don't discriminate against them. I love them all. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, looking forward to this upcoming spring, the ice getting off the lakes. Uh, we'll get out there and start chasing chasing some fish. I can't wait. Yeah, that'll be good. So yeah, if anyone wants to, to get in touch, uh, we're not taking bookings just yet, just because COVID stuff is still kind of up in the air. But um, we will be, you know, getting getting on to that soon. So in the interim, if you want to drop us a note and get in touch with Matt, then you can start chatting about uh, our fishing plans for the spring. And well, awesome. worth, well worth it having fish with Matt. It's a great experience for sure. Cool. Uh, great. Well, thank you for the opportunity again, Chris. Yeah, thank you for coming back, Matt. And um, uh, next week we've got a couple more. As always coming up, we've got uh, another presentation with Ian Troop. Uh, another guy, local angler, uh, tying some awesome trout flies next Thursday evening. And then myself, actually, I'll be doing a beginner's fly tying introductory kind of uh, session next Saturday, same time, 10 a.m. If anyone wants to tune in for that. We can look forward to Awesome. Thanks, Kim. I'll be tuned into those for sure. <laughs> look forward to seeing you there. All right. All right. Take care, everyone. Guys, we'll see you soon. Bye.